She I is mean, hot. She's well, super the sun, hot. The sun is setting, so it's going to get cooler and cooler. All I right. got nothing under here, so All right. is staying Here on. we go. <laughs> Here's the doctor. By the way, they said they like our joint ponytails. We have matching hair. I started it. Is it hey. guys? Hello. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Oh man, it's so good to like meet you via video. Um, yeah. And I, I thought it'd be fun for Emily to join because she is on this relentless journey to her own radical awakening. Yeah. And um, so thank you. Thank you for letting me hijack this and just listen in. I'm oh so excited. God. So for anybody just tuning in, uh, the book is A Radical Awakening. We're not talking about man enough today. We'll talk about it next week. Um, and we're talking about really being woman enough in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. So I wrote this book because as a clinical psychologist, uh, just working with woman after woman, and even in my own journey, just never feeling like, the ceiling could be broken and how mm -hmm. our self-worth has been corrupted, interrupted, disrupted since childhood. Uh, and the toxic patriarchy has kind of just managed to suppress us. And the funniest thing is this book is out and the only negative pushback I get is from males. I mean, it's fascinating. Oh, it's okay. Me too. <laughs> 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 it feels so bad, but it's not, it's not every man, you know, it's, it's the unconsciousness mm -hmm. of this patriarchy that doesn't want to be toppled and is nervous with radical books like yours and mine. You know, I find mm. so interesting what I love. Uh, I've, I've actually started listening to the audio book because I'm a big audio book person. And you do a fantastic job, by the way. That's a very hard thing to do. It took me a long time. Yeah. Are you um, reading it yourself? Oh my goodness. Oh, yeah. It's, oh, yeah. it's 15 hours of audio, so it takes like seven days or something. Yeah. How many days did it take you? It took me eight or nine. <laughs> yeah, I really struggled it's, with it. It's you exhausting. Did. I did. It was, it's but, really good. But I love, I just love how you also set up the book. And uh, I was thinking a lot about um, Emily, because as her husband, I've been watching her shed a lot of the things that you talk about in the book and mm -hmm. and you know you really you you really are talking to women when you write this book and i have a lot of female um uh, followers and audience members and and so i think it was it's the perfect uh place to talk about this because i also think that as a man we should be reading mm -hmm. books for women um i think that's also really important uh to help us understand our partners more if we're in heterosexual uh relationships but the way you set up the book uh, I just found kind of fascinating because you prepare them and I did a similar thing, but you prepare them for how triggered and uncomfortable they're going to be. <laughs> and I think <laughs> I that's, that. I think that's really important because I, I, I talk a lot about getting comfortable in the uncomfortable and that cold plunge. Um, I'm sitting in that ice cold water and not wanting to get out and we're wanting to get out, but not getting out and knowing that bliss is on the other side. And you really do that a lot in your book. Can you walk us through mm. a little bit about um, what people should expect women or, you know, if they choose to, uh, men should expect when they read your book and why they'll be triggered and why that's a good thing. So um, all the books I write have been trigger triggering to people. So in my first four books, uh, the first three specifically on conscious parenting, uh, I changed the parenting paradigm by just turning it on its head that we are not here to raise our children when we haven't raised ourselves. So our childhood baggage kind of follows, follows us. So this book, A Radical Awakening, is written as a journey. And I take people on this journey. And the first part is how we've been asleep in the matrix. So that is extremely triggering to people because they're like, I'm not asleep. I'm super conscious. But the fact is, is that most of us are so asleep, we're almost in a zombie-like state, and we don't know it because we wear our beliefs like skin. And we cannot believe that the beliefs we have are mostly lies. So it's extremely touchy and sensitive when you, are, when you begin to wake up to the realization, wow, 
My mm. culture has lied to me. My parents have told me things that are not necessarily true. So mm. I talk about how we've all been seduced in the matrix, in this culture, the cultural bubble, you know, drug induced, and we don't realize we are in an in a drug induced den. So that is triggering for people. So I'm very mm. gentle with people. I think they they still think I'm not gentle, but and then I I, I go on to how we have to confront our shadow. You know, if we really want to begin to disrupt our patterns, we have to look at what's in the back story, what's in the back end, what's deep down. And mm -hmm. we have to kind of ex excavate that and stare at ourselves brutally, honestly, transparently in the mirror and mm -hmm. see how our childhood has set us up for these robotic patterns. The people we marry, the foods we eat, the way we talk to ourselves in our head, these are programmed into us. And, they, and we think that it's just who we are. We don't realize it's our program, right? So a lot of my work with my clients is to make them realize these are not your thoughts. These are conditionings. And mm -hmm. it takes them so long to understand that they have a choice to change their patterns, right? And mm -hmm. then uh, I talk a lot about female sexuality and how we've been disconnected from our vaginas and how we need to reclaim our power and stop giving our power away to men. And well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. <laughs> Wait, let, me finish, <laughs> let me finish in an OCD way the whole book. Then after the re reclamation of the vagina, then I go into how do you crack the matrix? And I talk mm. about busting our ideas about love, marriage, divorce, beauty, youth, niceness. You know, we girls have been trained to be so nice. Oh. So I kill that. I kill that and I replace <laughs> kill it. the slay it. Slay it. Yeah. <laughs> Decimate it. Murder it. Um, yeah. We, we replace the idea of niceness with authenticity. You know, quit mm. being good. Stop being nice because you're lying. You, are you authentic? And then the final chapter, uh, the final part is called Awakening, which is about really embracing the. Um, egoless way of living and embracing your essence. So that's kind of how the book is laid out. We're talking about Radical Awakening, guys. Oh and, um, yeah. so, that is so amazing. It's been out for a week now. Uh, yes. Again, pick it up. It's called Radical Awakening. Um, she, uh, Dr. Shafali, is incredible. And uh, it's really, it's so funny. Just hearing you talk, first of all, I talk about The Matrix at the beginning of my book as well. <laughs> uh, I, I yeah. talk about how I'm I'm stuck in it, and so yeah. I think we're going to be best friends. Uh, so that's a side note. Um, but uh, I'm I now I want to know. Can we talk about what the, the go ahead. sexuality, embracing female sexuality? Well, sexuality. yeah. Well, well, you, what I, you said something. No, please ask. Yeah. No, what I was going to say, you know, something that I've noticed on my own journey of shedding a lot of ideas and beliefs and behaviors and even identities that I've created. Um, it can be a scary journey because I've had moments of wondering what's left, what's gonna be left. And then I tap into that and it feels incredibly powerful, which is also scary as hell. Um, and I feel like that, that kind of links in with, even with the sexuality. It's like we, we've been taught to kind of put it inside a box and that's not where sexuality or creativity or life uh, should exist at all. Um, but when it breaks out of that box, it can just feel so powerful. And um, I don't know, I think that I think that's where I am personally, it can be a really scary place. I don't know if you I'm sure it's you talk like, about it in your it's book. It's almost but... like you've been Whew. as <clears throat> so as my, I'm witnessing my wife go through her own radical awakening. And I love that you call it radical awakening. Mm -hmm. And I also love how you talk about how awakening is, you know, if you think about the awakening, it's not a gentle thing. Like getting out of the matrix is not fun, no. right? It's not a fun process. But it's, it's only because it's, we're riddled with fear, uh, you know, because we, we have so many attachments in the matrix. Even if it's totally effed up, we're attached to it, you know? Absolutely. So when you say you're scared, it's only because it's the unknown, right? Like you were saying, the cold water, you're plunging in the unknown. And this is how we've been conditioned is you got to put it in a box. You have to have the prescription list. You got to know where you're going. But true spiritual warriorship has no destination, is completely in the moment, and trusts the impermanence of that kind of moment by moment existence. But it's very anti Western, you know, very anti masculine. 
it's very scary for people to embrace that. But what you also said is that it's so liberating and you feel almost bad saying it because mm -hmm. what you're really experiencing is a final untethering from other people's unconsciousness. Mm -hmm. You're no longer betrothed to their level of unconsciousness. You're free. And we all have the destiny to be free, but we've tethered ourselves thinking that that is true connection, but it isn't. It's true attachment out of fear. Mm. <laughs> so we all put each other into boxes, you know, our sexuality, yeah. marriage, the idea of beauty, the idea of eternal youth. We mm -hmm. have caged ourselves and women do it to themselves now. Oh, yeah. Right. You know how you how you talk to yourself when looking in the mirror. Oh, oh, my gosh. We are relentless. It's that incessant chatter. I think he writes about it in uh, in the untethered soul about how your ego is like this. I'm going to butcher it now. But it's just like this weird guest that just kind of invited himself and he's sleeping on your couch and he has an opinion about everything that you're doing and he wants to label everything that you're doing. It's just constant advice and chatter and just the noise of the ego and the mind. Uh, that can also be a little terrifying to realize that that's the constant thing that is running in the background. Yeah, but we've inherited this. We, mm. You know, culture has told us how to be the perfect woman, but now we oppress ourselves. You know, we are mm -hmm. our worst critics and we yeah. compete with each other and we, we dim our light. And uh, the only way we can really heal the planet is through the rising of the awakened male and the awakened female. But really we, we females, we women have to take charge because we yeah. are the connectors. We are the, the tribe builders. We are the mothers. So um, the onus is on the oppressed always to rise up. You know, we can't wait for the ones in privilege to give us permission, you know. Mm. Uh, how, does, how does someone, besides getting your book, start to go through that process? Because I've watched Emily do it, but the process of inner work um, and really, and that inner work leading to that awakening. Mm. What's, that, what's that look like? I don't know what you've experienced, but typically as a therapist, people only really start jolting into awareness when they hit a rock bottom. Like I can already tell when a client comes, oh, they're not ready yet. They're talking, they say, I want to change, but mm -hmm. change involves a death. So I say real change means you're gonna have to die onto mm -hmm. an old part of you. And they're like, really? I just thought the other people could change. <laughs> so. True transformation requires a releasing of the old. And we don't want to do that because we're deeply attached to the old. So we want all the jewels of the new, but we can't let go of the old. And this mm -hmm. is why most people languish. They're apathetic, they're complacent, and they're stuck. It's because we don't realize that in order to pivot to the new, the, the trade-off for the, the, the delicious prize of the newfound freedom, like Emily said, is the terrifying loss of the old attachments. And we can't have it both ways. And true spiritual growth is understanding that, that I have to leave the shell. I have to let go. You know, the chicken breaks out. She lets go of that egoic shell and dissolves it, crushes it, and she births. In the same way, we have to let go of our egoic masks in order to birth. But we're scared to. And culture has told women especially like literally the only negative critic uh, on my Amazon reviews, sorry to say, was a guy who called this book narcissistic. Women have been told we are narcissistic oh. for putting ourselves first. I mean, this is the message we get, no, Emily? That we yeah. are okay. he, he, the same guy probably commented on mine too. <laughs> oh. Because Called it threatens. Selfish. Yeah. yeah, selfish. A not a good woman. How could you be a you know family wrecker? So we mm -hmm. immediately get so guilty and feel so ashamed because yeah. we have not been encouraged to put ourselves first. And males mm -hmm. have been encouraged. You know, they're like, it's okay, be loud, be brash, take your time, lie down on the sofa all day. But we are guilty, you know. Mm -hmm. And now this book is boldly emblazoning the consciousness of women to wake up. And uh, there's so much pushback. Um, you know. Yeah, because I, the idea, I mean, I'm just going to tie this back to masculinity for a second. Yeah. And, and the illusion that it is. 
but I was uh, chatting. We have a, or we're friends with Astaire. I'm sure you're friends with Astaire Perel as well. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she's a, she's an, uh, she's an incredible person. And we had a chat about this and masculinity is so fragile that it can be taken away, mm -hmm. but femininity can't. You can't, you can't take someone's femininity away. You can't, I can't take that away from my wife, but the idea of masculinity is that she can take it from me and I can be somehow emasculated. Mm -hmm. Almost as if we as men are so fearful of the radical awakening of women mm -hmm. that we consciously repress them. And I say mm -hmm. consciously, like the guy, we consciously repress you because mm -hmm. God forbid you were to wake up <laughs> mm -hmm. from this, your slumber of the matrix you would recognize that this world doesn't serve you and I'm not serving you, I'm serving me. But I believe that a radically awoken man or a man who's man enough wants his, I'm not saying this is a possessive, but like woman to wake up because it's in your waking up that you help me wake up. But and you're the vibrations are tied together. Right, but you are way in the minority, Justin, and you know. Oh, I, oh, I, yes, I, I can, I can assure you of that by my, uh, by my book sales to the male demographic. But moving on, uh. <laughs> and like you said, I mean, it's not only like men doing this. Women are, we are doing this to ourselves. We yeah. are holding ourselves back because we don't know any other way. Right. You talk about this a lot. Last night we had a conversation, and and what you just said about. Uh, going through a death or hitting rock bottom hits home because we, this might sound strange, but we feel the most comfortable mm -hmm. around people who have uh, been through the program, been through a form of like a, 12 um, a 12 step program, like a no matter what it is, some form of recovering and addict. And because those people truly know themselves because they've had to face themselves, they've right. had to kill off that part that they were, right. that they were numbing. And, uh, and you go through this program, which is really a spiritual enlightenment uh, program, I think, and you mm -hmm. recognize that you can't do it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so we, last night we had this conversation about like the, our friends who have hit rock bottom, our friends, mm -hmm. those are the ones that we connect with in the deepest way. Absolutely. And people think in the, you know, um, the arrogance of this kind of toxic masculine ideology that it's a one man show. And it's only through interdependence and community, which we women are so amazing at building, that we can uplift and elevate each other. And you have to go through a quest, either the 12 step or intense work or this book, mm -hmm. your book, to open up uh, our inner uh, enlightenment to the understanding that we have been our greatest oppressors. All our suffering is now because we have subscribed. You know, we pay a mm -hmm. daily subscription to the toxicity and we don't realize we're paying our daily subscription. So this mm -hmm. book is challenging women, especially who complain a lot about being in the patriarchy, but I am showing women all the ways that they co-perpetuated and co-created mm -hmm. in their own mental suffering. And until we really awaken to how am I co-creating my own inner oppression, there's mm -hmm. no man around, I'm doing it to myself. I will not be able to shatter the ceiling and I will not be able to awaken and embolden myself to check the toxic masculinity. Just like this toxic masculinity, I talk about toxic femininity in my book, where because we're trying to be so nice, we yeah. have no voice now. We've divorced our inner knowing, our wisdom. Mm -hmm. We don't contribute. We're so scared. We're muted. So that's the toxic feminine part of us that, we, that needs to be integrated. And the toxic masculinity needs to be checked to come to this healthy, integrated approach where both sexes are able to be on both sides of masculine and feminine without shame. Mm. Mm. I get a lot of men who <clears throat> reach out to me and I've been talking a little bit about this, but I don't feel like it's my place to talk about this, especially in interviews. Um, and I actually left this part out of the book because I think it's for when Emily is ready to talk about it. Um, but the idea, you know, that Bell Hooks writes about um, and a will to change even about the internal misogyny that women face, right? As, mm -hmm. And what you're calling the toxic feminine. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because men, have, men write me, hey, Justin, I'm, you know, I did it. I was vulnerable. I cried. And she like responded terribly. 
She mm -hmm. made me feel less than. She mm -hmm. made me feel like there was something wrong with me. Like I needed to man up. And you hear mm -hmm. this a lot. Glennon Doyle writes about this in Untamed. Mm -hmm. um, this this thing where even you know, and we forget that that women are mm -hmm. also byproducts and have been socialized to need to view men as strong, right? Right, right. And so, and so that so there's something that, that about a, a vulnerable man that seems to trigger some women or many women. Yeah. Also, even though in their minds they want it. Mm -hmm. What is that? Right. Well, I think we are, you know, so we've absorbed this toxic masculine idea, ideology that males are supposed to be holding the power and we are. global culture ubiquitously feelings real feelings true vulnerability has always been denigrated so we women say we want our males to be vulnerable but we can't hold space for that either and we can't hold space for ourselves either we don't know how to have direct expression of feelings we're scared so we, we are globally afraid of truth of authenticity mm -hmm. we're wearing masks and it's time for your book and mine. I mean, they came out so well and close together to help people to awaken. It's uh, we're talking mm -hmm. about uh, Dr. Shafali's book, Radical Awakening. Um, well, please go pick it up. Uh, it's if if you picked up Man Enough since we're you know we're on my channel here, I uh, I would encourage you to read this with it. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling, you know, considering uh, most of you, most most of you are women that are watching this. Let's be honest. Uh, Man enough is going to help you understand your men. This is going to help you understand yourself. Mm, I love um, it. Uh, so can you just talk to us a little bit? Um, you talk about uh, uh, the pill, the pill that kills, right? And by the way, The Matrix is one of my favorite movies, so I, I can talk about The Matrix all day long. <laughs> uh, um, by the way, one of my favorite things, one of my favorite things recently is, you know, when you see all these men talking about, you know, red pill and all of this stuff, and it's now becoming this um, movement in this alt men's movement. But what they fail to recognize is, I don't know if you know this, but The Matrix was really written uh, to be analogous to the, tr to the trans experience. Mm, I didn't know that. Actors transitioned afterwards mm. so so anyways so i always kind of find that ironic when men are using it about like being alpha and like you know, right right you know even now you're talking about uh this was a trans person who, who mm, came up with this right. um, but what's the pill that kills so the fundamental pill that kills us all i think at the core male or female alpha or not is unworthiness we all are living with this lie that we have believed that we are essentially unworthy. So even though this current dimension seems to be ruled by powerful, you know, white men, just to, to speak stereotypically, it's an unworthy uh, occupation. And how do we know it's unworthy? Because we're not taking care of everyone below that top pedestal. We're not taking care of the earth. We're not taking care of our children, the women, the people of color. So it is such a toxic hierarchy right now uh, but it is ruled by unworthiness. If we were not unworthy, the opposite of the antidote of unworthiness is interconnection, not codependence, not independence, and interdependence. Mm -hmm. When we are in worthiness, when we are connected to our inner self, we understand that we, we cannot exist without each other. There is a healthy mm -hmm. appreciation that you are me and I am you. And that's how the planet begins to heal. So unless this toxic hierarchy topples and gets exposed for its true unworthiness, it looks like it's really fancy because now we're going to Mars, we've destroyed the Amazon, we've destroyed the oceans. It looks like it's world domination. Like, look how amazing we are. We've dominated the world. But that's toxically masculine, right? That's, that domination is toxic. Interdependence. And we, why did I write this book for women specifically is because we live with the code of interdependence, you know, just by our bodies, one becoming two, becoming one with birth. We understand inextricable interdependence. We give our bodies, we share our bodies for those who are biological mothers. So males don't get this oxytocin hormonal understanding mm -hmm. on a physiological level that we have it, you know, sorry, we got it. But we 
have been marauded by culture to forget it. So we need to awaken back to what our bodies naturally can do and when we capitalize on it. That's why the mother energy is a powerful energy. When the woman becomes a mother, she's like, don't fuck with my children, right? So mm -hmm. because now she sees, I, I, I am a, a creator, I'm a co-creator, I'm part of the earth. So we women need to enter our renaissance and remember who we are. It is not a world that will survive with toxic masculinity. We women need to make that change. Mm. Wow. It's really all the work you're doing. It's, yes, which is why I'm kind of speechless because it's just <laughs> like, it's so, it's, I'm so in it and I, and I love it so much. I specifically love what you said early on that it's a radical awakening on all sides that is really going to heal all the ailments that we're dealing with now. That's what's going to save us. Um, and we talk about that a lot too, that, you know, it's great to be an activist for different issues, but the most important kind of activism, did we lose? No, she's there. Okay. Yeah. The most important um, type of activism is, is self-work, is that radical awakening that you're writing about. Yeah, because yeah. then we become that authentic being that you're talking about. And we know what integrity is. We know what true power it is. We know what truth is. And from that place, I mean, just imagine the, the decisions that we can make, the, the choices that are before us and the way that we treat each other and ourselves and honor everything. It's just, yeah, it's just been on our minds yeah. a lot. That's, that's, that's true activism. Well, activism without <laughs> activism without the radical awakening. I mean, it uh, can only go so far. It's like performative or wokeness. It's performative, yeah. <laughs> it, it won't. It true. won't last, and it will uh, lead to resentment and abuse and violence and separation. Mm -hmm. When you radically awaken, like you said, Emily, you're so connected to your own worth that mm -hmm. you honor the sovereign worth of everyone around you. Back off because your ego dissolves. You know, mm -hmm. as you radically awaken, like you said, your identities to false things dissolves and then your true essence comes out and now you can't destroy the essence of others. So mm -hmm. all ideas of separation of casteism, classism, racism, sexism, all the isms kind of fade because you've disintegrated all the inner schisms. You're one with yourself. You're one with the others. You have no thorns anymore because you heal those. So this book, you know, because I'm a therapist, I was able to really use my experience, but I also share a lot of my own story, which was vulnerable like making. And Justin, you, you've been doing that too. And it's the, it's only when you allow your own story to emerge that you give permission to others. Right. Well, and there is no shame. There is no shade. There is no ego about it. And that's the radical awakening. Well, even mm. in that beginning of your first chapter, you talk about you almost hitting that tree, being so exhausted from being a new mother. Um, and you haven't read the book yet, but she almost runs She's into in this part. tree. Yeah. And, uh, and that kind of, you know, you wake up right before because the car stops. And I just found that it's fascinating and so important because again, you're giving permission to women who are feeling the exact same things, but feel like they can't talk about it. Can you just quickly talk about that? Um, the, the blame, the fear, blame, shame cycle. Because mm. uh, I oh think that goodness. relates that relates a bit to also that story. And I know a lot of the stuff that we're that we talk about. Yeah. Yeah. So we women get stuck in this loop of fear, blame and shame. So what what that is, is that we, we don't realize but we're living in a fog, right? We're living with all these messages. Be good, be kind, be skinny, be uh, a, a super achiever, be the best cook, be the best mother. I mean, we are whether we accept it or not, we're all trying to meet the standard of that some utopic Olympian, amazing Amazon woman. Right. We want to be it all you know, for our men, for our children, for our partners, everybody. So uh, we, are, we are really oppressed by the idea of that perf perfect person. And for that, we totally divorce our authentic self. So I was on this mission without realizing to be that zenith of a woman, the perfect wife, the perfect mother, the PhD student, I was, had to be skinny, of course. And I was exhausting myself on this, constant uh, conveyor belt this hamster wheel and then one day my car just i almost hit the tree 
So I call it soul erosion. That was my wake up call. Like something is drastically off course. Like literally my car went off course because I was misaligned. Mm -hmm. And so many mothers get caught up in the identity of motherhood. When we become wives, we're identity of the wife. You know, these become our projects, our PhDs. Yeah. And, um, but that's how we crucify ourselves. You know, we, we need to separate from our children and let them live out their own destiny. So we are so afraid to not be perfect. That's the fear. Mm -hmm. And we blame and shame ourselves constantly. We, take, we, we think that that's the way to take responsibility, but we don't realize that that's just self-castigation, you know? Mm -hmm. True accountability is to heal. Yes. Is to feel the identity that is mired in the false persona and the mask of the perfect person. Okay. That's the true healing. That's true accountability. But we just flog ourselves and we're like, I'm taking responsibility. No, you're not. You're just perpetuating the fear, blame, shame cycle. Mm. Well, it's like, is this got, idea that... You got, first of all, <laughs> radical awakening... From Dr. Shafali, we're talking about radical. Awakening. I can't wait to read it. You can get it. You can get it uh, anywhere wait. books are sold, right? Mm -hmm. I saw it. Uh, I, I went into Barnes and Noble and I saw it uh, next to mine. I thought that was really sweet. <laughs> that's, awesome. that's, really sweet. Uh, that's so cool. Oh no, I was just going to add to that. It's just like this idea that you know, if we're not a martyr in the name of love, then we haven't loved enough. That's been a huge one for me. Wow. You know, yeah. to realize that that's a lie that I've been telling myself. And that's the yeah. side I'm telling myself. Yeah, we, we can like, not be like, martyrs. Yeah, we have to be martyrs, victims. Yeah, we have to suffer. We have to give of ourselves to the point of abnegation. Yeah. You know? Yeah, because that's the noble way to be the perfect mother right. and the perfect wife. Yeah. So to yeah. put ourselves first is an abomination. We literally mm -hmm. have and we not we get nausea because mm -hmm. our conditioning is. Don't take up space. Don't mm -hmm. put yourself first. Give of yourself. And it's, it really mind trips us, you know? Yeah. It's, we, we face so much conflict to just speak up where males can just speak up without a problem. We spend right. so much energy in the boardroom. Should I say something? When should I say something? I don't want to hurt someone's feelings. Oh my goodness, mm -hmm. what will they think of me? You think males are going through this in their head? They just mm -hmm. speak, you right. know? So look how much we have to go through just to come to the table because of our conditioning. Right. And then when we dare to speak up and we do begin to find our power, we're called crazy. We're called yeah. wild. We're dramatic. Called all these dramatic, dramatic or yeah. hormonal or there she goes again or, yeah. you know, all these things like we were almost bullied back into that old box that we were in. And I feel like it takes so much bravery to stick with the journey. I know. Um, which is, again, why I'm so excited to read your book because it is like, we need that constant reminder. We need those creative juices pumping and coming in to kind of hold us there, hold us accountable and help us stick to the journey. Right, once we realize that this is the way of the toxic patriarchy, we won't take it personally. See, we take everything yes, personally. We so do. we're like, because we're fragile too. Yeah. But once you realize that this is the way of the unconscious, this is, mm -hmm. they're going to dominate, they're going to be threatened. If you're wise enough to understand the game, then you're not going to let it infiltrate you and mm -hmm. put you back down. You go, I feel compassion for you that you have to interrupt me all the time. I feel compassion for you that you don't want to see my power. I get it. I understand. You've never seen females in their power. I get it. And we can have compassion for the male who's not exposed and yeah. we can train them. We have to train them. You see, we run away the minute they put us down. We're like, okay, I tried that, mm -hmm. bye. No, yeah. we have to train them to get used to us talking, to used to us being there. They just are mm. not trained. But you, you know, know what's interesting, doctor, I is, I think what's also interesting about this though, is the other side of it, as a man being here with you too, uh, awakened women um, <laughs> is that the reason the reason that men do the things that they're doing is because of their lack of enoughness exactly. because the patriarchy it's that ironically has the same effect on men as it does on women so what ends up happening is is the lack of enoughness of us needing to prove our worth as men in this power uh, dominant system Yes. Um, means that we must exercise power over anybody who is Everybody. left out the full, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and unfortunately, 
women tend to be the people that men do that with because men have a hard time doing it with other men. Because we're oftentimes, depending on who you are, there's always somebody who's going to be bigger, stronger, better, faster, you know, with a, a, you know, more money, a bigger house, a nicer car, a bigger dick, all of it, right? It all exists in the patriarchy. But when men feel less than, we find our power in the domination of someone else. And that tends to be women. And so it comes from a lack of enoughness from that same thing that you mm -hmm. talk about with women. And we're all <laughs> suffering in the same way. 100%. And I tell you, this nuclear system that we're in, where the one male gets to come home because he feels insecure that, you know, he wasn't as big as the guy at work or as powerful, and he comes home and dumps on the women and the children and the dogs. So when we lived in tribes, the men checked each other, and mm -hmm. the females were together to check the, the men. So this is what we need to band together and understand that the men are not evil. We raise them. They are sons. They are brothers. Mm -hmm. This is not about separation, right? Your mm -hmm. message isn't about separation. Mine is not about... There's no battle of the it's sexes great. here. Yeah, yeah, it's about compassion that our sons and our brothers yeah. we need to turn their light bulbs on but instead of complaining that the light bulbs are off how are we yeah. going to rise up to go hey i'll train you and even if it takes time and i know it's not our burden but we got to embrace the issue we got to embrace the problem we have mm -hmm. to educate them people mm -hmm. of color have to speak up it's tiring why do we need to speak up we got to speak up because the paradigm that dominates is unconscious. So we women don't need to waste time complaining or being scared. We need to band together in a sisterly, mm -hmm. sororal community. And we need to check the men and teach them. We need to teach our sons. We need to teach our yeah. daughters. And that's yeah. where the real change but happens. You, so you're going to, yes. so, so Dr. Shafali, you're probably going to get some pushback. Because oh, I know if, if I know a little bit about, you know, <laughs> She's uh, ready for in, in my, you know, in my, as I'm a, you know, I would consider myself a baby uh, feminist mm -hmm. in training. I can tell you that I've encountered in feminist circles this idea also of a lot of women saying, well, it's not my responsibility. It's their job. Mm -hmm. I've been oppressed long enough. You mm -hmm. go fix it. Right. And that is the energy that men are responding to, which is why men are forming their alt-right men's male, like, I'm a victim movement happening at the same time because mm -hmm. they're responding to this energy and they think that feminism hates men where i as i believe i kind of prescribe to the bell hooks idea of feminism which is this idea that no true is, so, yes right? so compassionate so, so and, compassionate exactly but yeah. so so where do you so you know this idea of that you have to teach and and look i'll be honest save it not for the women for my wife man enough my book doesn't exist me on my you know enlightened journey my awakening doesn't exist so i do believe to a certain extent and it's tricky to say that yeah, i'm very lucky that i had women be willing to teach me mm -hmm. and to take me on the journey there's many men don't and then there's the men that are you know pushed away from the women oh you know it's a this is a women's movement not this is not about you it's about me what, so how do you respond to that you know, it's the same thing, you know, my, my friend, uh, you know, for a, a long time was a full on lesbian, and then she decided to like a guy. I mean, she was killed, you know, it's the same thing. We are repeating the paradigms of domination and separation, right? So now it's become men against women or gay against straight. Or it's, it's the same idiocy that's occurring. It's the same illusion. And there is, I, I don't want to be called a feminist if I'm against men. I don't, I don't care about the title. It doesn't interest me. I don't, you know, people ask me all the time, are you a feminist? Now the feminists will be upset with me because I don't want a title. I don't want a label. Call me anything. I'd rather be called a giraffe or, I mean, you know what I mean? Like call me, mm -hmm. I don't want to have an identity. I'm here to help heal both souls or whatever you want to call it, both essences to integrate. So I'm not interested in, in being this kind of a feminist or not a feminist. I'd rather just have compassion for mm -hmm. unconsciousness. I see where the unconscious loops are, and that's all I care about. I don't even care about your body, your face, or your cars. It's the unconsciousness that we are trying to poke at and heal. So mm -hmm. the unconsciousness can look whatever it likes. That's not the seduction. The real seduction, the real work is the unconsciousness. Why are we unconscious? What are we believing? Where are we coming from in terms of lack, scarcity, 
unworthiness, impoverishment. That is the foundation of all anger, right? Is impoverishment. So there is no separation. There yeah. is no man to hate. I, I agree completely. Yeah. There's no man to hate. You're giving your power when you hate a man. You're, that's exactly mm -hmm. what I'm, we're teaching. Don't give your power. Hatred is power. Mm -hmm. so, and we know it's a very, it was a, it's a very small minority of feminists anyways that prescribe to that ideology. Yeah. Uh, but of yeah. course, that's all the men need. <laughs> that's all the men need to use it against them, them right? And that's why right. we and, weaponize and, words. We right. politicize words. We weaponize and politicize labels, which is why I'm with you. Screw the labels. Let's heal yeah. people. Let's exactly. bring people together. Let's have conversations that are uncomfortable. You yes. have one belief. I have another. Let's talk and share a meal. And yes. not hate each other and recognize yeah. and find our similarities versus our differences, right? Uh, we need so much more of that. And again, going back to what you said, but unless we do that true inner work and you buy the book it's Radical right Awakening and you go on that journey and you are an activist, a self-activist, you don't even know what you really stand for or believe because in. Because you be won't activist. know how to give and show compassion unless you're giving it to yourself. Yep. Like it really does begin with self-compassion. Yeah, passion towards the self and all the trauma that we've had and all the everything that we are. At least that, that's the only way that I've ever learned true compassion is by first knowing what it is, what it feels like in me, mm. and then to be able to give it to somebody else. But you talk about self compassion in the book. Mm. Yeah. So I talk, I, the definition of compassion for me is just, you know, self compassion. And uh, people often think compassion is for the other. You know, don't have compassion for the other because that if you bypass like Emily said, your own self-integration, self-acceptance. Because right. once you accept yourself, you're going to expect, accept others. So it right. comes from the inside. You don't have to work on this. You don't have to train yourself mm. to yeah. have compassion for mm. others. Mm. The only reason you don't have compassion for others is because you live with a severe inner critic. That's mm. the only reason. And if you're attached to your ism, if it's your religion, your caste, your age, your class, if you're attached and that's your identity, immediately you've created separation. That's why the greatest plague are the isms, you know? Mm. So I don't want an ism in my life I because that creates separation, you know? So we have to really deconstruct how our belief systems have actually caused us to hate each other and create distance between each other, mm. you know, not oneness. Our so mental how, do, so how do we do that, right? So how do we de-identify as i say in my book unlearn and undefine what's that what's that process uh so i call it a deconstruction you know so i teach this all the time to people uh you know which is a very very provocative process of taking the belief and really understanding the conditioned brainwashing around it mm. you know and uh you know the Nature doesn't believe in anything, for example, right? Nature follows laws that govern the physics of the universe. Uh, the laws typically are, you know, gravity, impermanence. You don't have to believe in gravity. You don't have to believe in impermanence. You're going to die. You're going to die. So it's not a belief system. It's the isness of nature. But mm -hmm. humankind loves to create beliefs, you know, and it's my belief and then your belief and see the wars in the world are based on ideological warfare, ideology, that in the mind. So this is where the problem is. And so how do you do that? You have to be brave to look at what you were given in your childhood as the sanctified holy way to be and dare to say who said. Is it true? Mm. You know, does the tree believe in what I this? Does the law of nature follow this belief system? And most likely it won't because the law of nature is interdependent. It's based on very simple cause and effect. And there is no superior or inferior. You know, mm. there, there's a hierarchy in nature. You know, the gazelle will be eaten by the lion, but there's an acceptance of that. Mm. You know, there's no resistance there. They know, they all know what's coming, right? Oh shit, I'm going to die. And there's just the release. But for us, because we don't want to die, yeah, we're doing, time. you know, it's a multi-million dollar, billion dollar business. Like, let's not grow old, let's not die. Right. So we're anti-nature, right? Mm -hmm. Everything is anti-nature. Mm -hmm. uh, because we have a morbid fear of being insignificant. Every yeah. one of us wants to be significant, you know? Uh, so as long as we're hungry for that, we're going to dominate. Yeah.
It reminds yeah. me, we, Emily and I are both Baha'is. And uh, in the Baha'i faith, one of the, one of the uh, main tenets is the independent investigation of truth. Right. Mm -hmm. Meaning you don't take truth because you heard it from your mm -hmm. pastor or your right. mother or your friend. Right. You right. must independently investigate. God's greatest gift to us were our faculties, mm -hmm. our ability to comprehend, to know God, to understand and learn and know science, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if you go into a Baha'i temple, because they have those in India, yeah, the lotus you, won't, you won't see much in there nope. because they invite you to go within. It's just space, mm -hmm. right? It's, right? It's yeah. beautiful space. And it's, space. there's no objects to latch on to. You're like, okay, who do I believe? What do I do? Where's, mm -hmm. but no, there's nothing. It's space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. because it's one of the things that people, people don't yes. get. You go in and you think you're going to see the, the Vatican with all yeah. this gold and you actually go. And you just see, people. you just see. There's, there's nine entrances for yes. open to all. Yes. And then it's like, oh, this is just a big room. You're like, yeah. yeah I is. love it. <laughs> you know, because yeah. it, even, even Hinduism, even though it's an ism, um is open it's a it's the the analogy is open bowl like no no nothing to hold on to of course it's all become corrupted now i mean humans corrupt everything but uh one i went to a baha'i temple when i was like maybe five or six and my mother told me look this is just this is for you to enter your own inner space it's a space for you to enter your own inner space you know because i was also thinking where's the cross where's the rosary where's the where's the gold where's the you know give me something but it, there was nothing. And that's the beauty of Baha'i. And very few people know about Baha'i, you know? Uh, it's, it's just inner spaciousness. Yeah. Mm. Look, we, I think we could talk to you forever. Forever. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, I, you probably end it before it turns into actual couples therapy. Um, <laughs> no, you're going to uh, come on my Instagram and we're going to talk deconstruct your book. Oh, we'll talk, yeah, audience. we'll do that next week. We're, Emily and I are going to Sweden on Sunday, so we'll do it. I'll be in Sweden. It'll be like nine o'clock okay. at night or something. And uh, I love it. I love it. I love it. And Emily, when you read the book, let's have a a girl girl chat on, oh, on my Instagram. Please, I would love okay. that. I'm. I actually, he tried to find this book. He's like, where's Where's the book? Where's the book? It was already in my back. I couldn't. So part part of why <laughs> I, I was late. Taxes. Part of why I was late. <laughs> you were looking. The book. And I'm like, where's I'm the book? Back. <laughs> she backed it. I'm so excited. I was okay, so excited. Emily, you and I have a date, and Justin and I have a date. So yes, thank you please. for sharing my book. Mm. So again, uh, I'm gonna here. I'm just gonna open this up real quick and turn these back on because I know people uh, people have been commenting. But uh, please pick this up, Radical Awakening. It was written uh, by Dr. Shafali for women, but I want to encourage the few guys that are hanging out on this yes. right now to read it because in the same in the same way that uh, so many women are reading my book to understand men, I believe as men, we should be reading this book to understand women. Um, because I think the, the greatest barrier between us is our lack of understanding for each other mm. and our lack of compassion for each other. Yes. Um, and I think that ends the argument of who's more tired and who worked harder and who did this and all of the stuff that we get stuck in as couples if we just were able to understand each other. Mm. Um, yeah, we would just be building bridges instead of walls in our relationships. Mm. So love, thank you for that. writing this book and also thank for your previous you. books that help us all be better parents. Yes. Ooh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm Buy so honored it. to have Pick shared this up. time. Thank you, guys. All right. Bye. Hey, nourish your soul. Rest yourself because I know how hard it is. You're in the middle of it right now. I know I you have know. book out. So. <laughs> Book launches are intense. Sending you love and some, so and some rest for yourself. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank Good you. night. Bye, everybody.